decided, as probably most Lincoln City supporters know, we'd gone the previous season with our last game to Southport. We were in fourth position and Chester were in fifth. And if we'd gone to Southport and lost only 1-0, we would have remained in fourth position. If we lost any more than that, then in fact we went to fifth and Chester took fourth because of goal average, not goal difference, which people say it was. In fact, we lost 3-2, so we went to fifth and Chester were promoted with a better goal average. I would say this as well, that because of that, goal average was then changed to goal difference because our away better performance was better than, uh, than Chester's. You know, there was a lot of things that said, is this really right that that should happen? But what it did, I, I made, without me knowing at the time, I was so disappointed. I mean, I, we came home, we played Grimsby Town in the Lynx Senior County Cup final. I think we had a lot of people there to watch us play because they expected us to come back promoted. Bitterly disappointing uh, night for the players, some in tears, and certainly myself, when I went home that, uh, from Southport, and uh, I was really, really disappointed. And there were some tears from me, but I made probably what was a very good managerial decision without me probably realising at the time. I kept the side together and just added John Fleming, in fact, to the squad. And uh, there was so much determination the following year. And so when we got promotion with this sort of record number of points and everything else that went with it, it was like we'd had two great years because the disappointment of the previous year was put to one side. And it was a fantastic season. Peter Grote was a first class keeper. Peter Grote was, was funny in many respects because he would, they'd line up with a corner against us and he'd shout to the players, I ain't coming for this. He said, I'm not coming. And we'd get free kicks against us and he'd line the wall up and he'd say to them, he's a funny lad, he'd say, Why are we lining a wall up? They're going to score anyhow. <laughs> now you just imagine, you've got to get used to this kind of player. What Peter was, though, was what all good called, he only made saves on shots that were on target. So he knew his angles. Now, every now and again, he might make a mistake and not get them right. The ball would go in the net and he hadn't dived. And he would get criticised. Very, very occasionally that happened, but he would get criticised for it. But the hallmark of a, of a good goalkeeper, you dive for shots that are on target. You don't dive to save shots that are going wide. And Peter Grote had that. And he, he cost us about sixteen to £17,000. He'd come on loan. But in fact, what a lot of people forget, we had a whip round with the supporters and I think they raised about £6,000. You just imagine that, you're going round to your supporters. And that's why Lincoln City supporters played such a vital part in that season. They found about £6,000 to meet the cost of buying Peter Grote or in as the first team goalkeeper. Jimmy Gordon, well he was unfortunate because he got Peter in front of him. He played one game in the FA Cup in the second round at Mansfield and we won that. And that was the only first team game he had. But Jimmy was first class because he was a young boy and he was enthusiastic. And he was working also with a good goalkeeper, with Peter Grote. And he was prepared to wait for his time. It never came for him simply because Peter never got injured and played. But you always knew you'd got a young enthusiastic keeper who was learning. And the one game he played at Mansfield, he played very, very well. In fact, we would have lost that game if it hadn't been for Jimmy Gordon's saves in the FA Cup in the second round. Ian Bramford played 46 games in the league and was a first-class right-back. Reliable, liked to play uh, in terms of, when I say liked to, liked to play, liked to pass it out. Ian wasn't a person who would just hit the ball. You know, I mean, the reputation I got later at Watford about long ball, and they said, oh, this was all worked out at Lincoln. It's a load of nonsense, absolute nonsense. And um, Ian Bradford would play it out, fit, pacey. We'd signed him from Doncaster Rovers. Ian was a very, very good player. I would say a player that really should not have come down into the fourth division. Ian was a player who could have played at that time, I would have thought possibly, second division football as it was then, and a good player. He was the second player I ever signed, and Dennis Lee was a two-footed player. Although he played at left back, he was good with his right foot. Not the quickest, 
intelligent, knew how to shepherd the wingers away, knew his angles, he knew what to do. He, he was primarily a defender. He was not an overlapping fullback. That was not his game. His game was, let's keep it tight. And if you're going to score against us, you're going to have to work hard. And he was hard. I mean, I'm not going to say dirty, but you, if you were tattled by Dennis, you knew you'd been tattled. He was not dirty, but he was a hard competitor. You didn't mess about with Dennis Lee. And I liked Dennis Lee. I've always liked Dennis Lee. He was one of my favourites, really, because I knew that he knew the game. He was a, a nice little quip now and again, and he's a little bit of character about him. But he was there to win, and you need that. Phil Neal. Phil Neal. Phil Neal had joined us from Scunlock United. I'd known his father and I liked Phil as a... But Phil was what I call an amateur when he came in. He was a great sportsman and a lot of people would appreciate He played football in an amateurish way in as much he was so honest that when he went to tackle, he was so open to tackle, he, he ran the risk of getting injured himself. So we, we had to teach him that the professional side of the game was very important. We knew he was good at cricket as well, but he was quick and he was a good learner. He was a quick, he's an intelligent lad. He'd come in with a 2-2 two -two from, I forget which university, in Russia. Now, that did not help him in football, but let's say he got a 2-2 two -two in Russia because he had the mickey taken out of him. And I remember bringing Phil into my office in the early days, young boy, and he, he couldn't quite understand the humour in the in a football dressing room and I remember saying to him, Phil, I would never want you to lose the intellect, the intelligence that you have. And, but sometimes, son, in the environment that you're in, you've got to be prepared to act like a peasant. All I want you to do is act like a peasant, but never be one. Because you're clever and you've got the shrewdness about doing things. He took that on board and when Dennis Lee went down with appendicitis halfway through the season, Phil Neal came in and actually played ever so, ever so well. And a typical sportsman, keep in touch with him. He couldn't, as you know, come to the, uh, the reunion simply on the basis that he is the operations manager for the successful England side. He's out in India. And uh, I phone him and speak to him even now, now and again. Um, you know, about whenever England lose, I always phone him and blame him. You know, so you've got to understand, Phil, you're a professional, you're in charge, I'm the manager of a football team, the team plays crap, but the manager gets the blame. So why, when England lose, should I not phone you up, Phil, and say, what are you doing, Neil, it's all your fault? So we get on fine. A good player again, but an intelligent boy. Terry, it was interesting because Terry and, and Sam personally were not, the, and Sam Ellis were not the best of friends. They weren't enemies, but they it, they came. They were different people, and um, they didn't get on off the pitch. There was no major problems ever, but they didn't get off. In fact, you would say Monday to Friday, you would not expect them to have really spoken to one another. On the Saturday, their understanding and their work was one of those first class. Two top professionals in the tap of when they were in the, ch the way that they went onto the pit. Quick, Terry, bite into the tackle. Uh, good header, didn't want to be beaten. Bit of a fiery temper about him now and again. The Welsh temper in there, but a good, good player. Oh, the fact that he didn't talk to his centre half Monday to Friday didn't bother me. The fact that he talked to him on a Saturday when they were playing, I was very pleased with. A ah, top man, a top man. In 1966, he'd been a young 19-year-old who played in the FA Cup final for Sheffield Wednesday along an experienced Jerry Young, lost 3-2 to Everton. Under Alan Brown, who was an excellent manager, gone to Mansfield with Danny Williams, I bought him to Lincoln. Needed managing, character of the highest order. Uh, could play hard, probably played harder than he sometimes worked hard, but he was not the best Monday to Friday trainer. He was a good. 
he was not a bad trainer, but he was not the best. But football, when it came to the game on a Saturday first class, on the Friday before, if you saw Sam train, you'd say, I ain't going to play him tomorrow. But to him, that was Friday. What was important was Saturday. And a leader, 12 goals from sending up. Yes, seven were penalties, but a great penalty taker. And also very good at scoring goals from court. I mean, 12 goals from a centre half in a season. You don't get much better than that, do you? Brings tears to your eyes, this man. Young boy, he was the youngest. We, I mean, that 16 players we had, they had some experience in the lower division, so they weren't going to stick together too long as a side, so they had to win. And if we hadn't won the championship in 75, 76, having failed in the promotion bid the year before, I'm not too certain how we would have stuck out. You know, we kept them together a little bit the following year and they finished ninth or 10th in the third division. I think that was it for them because some of them were coming into the 30s, but we had a young boy called Wigid. And he could play centre back. Lovely lad, listen everything. And he needed to be playing first team football to progress. So I was prepared to loan him out and move on. We moved him up to Hartlepool, I think it was Hartlepool United. Went out, another player driving a car, accident, dead. And it was a hard time for all of us because we all loved Wigged. He was a lovely lad, he was a lad that you warmed to, you liked, and he wanted to learn, he wanted to do well. It was a hard time for me personally because, understandably, Mr and Mrs Wiggett, his parents, found it, and the supporters won't be aware of this, but they found it hard to understand why I'd let him go to Hartlepool. And he needed to start to get first team football, that's why I'd let him go. But I found it very difficult because I felt I was being a bit blamed. But I totally understand it. The unfortunate thing, I knew Mr and Mrs Wiggett and I've never really seen them since that time. But he lives in your memory, does David Wiggett. And you talk to any Lincoln City player of that time, the other 15 lads, George, um, Bert Loxley, myself, Wiggett, Dave Wiggett was part of the 16. And you can see the way I'm talking about it. It's one of those, it's one of those deaths that shook us rigid. Unfortunately, it happened. But uh, I'm sure he's looking over us and saying, yeah, boss, you're right in everything that he said. I would have been a great player. <laughs> and you would, Wiggy. John Fleming came in. We started him off in the first two games because Dennis Booth was sus suspended. We started him off in a right midfield, but he was really an outright midfield player. He wasn't a winger. He played wide right midfield and could break out and could get his... And what John was, was very good at his angles, making himself available to get the ball, keeping the ball rolling. And then what he also was excellent at, when he got into the attacking third on the right flank, if he got the ball, he didn't, he, he didn't always have the ability to beat the left back, but he could cross a ball without beating him. And if you ask any fullback, the thing they hate is a wide man not taking them on but just crossing the ball, not giving them the chance to get a tackling. And what John would do, so he created many goals for us and was a very good player because he ended up going to Australia and still lives out there. Well Dick, what had happened in the year before, I played Dick as the outside right, he'd had a lot of trouble with his hamstring and I brought John Fleming in to take his place wide right. But Dick was always there, coming off the bench. I remember he, he started a game against Northampton, which we won 3-1. It was sometime just before Christmas. It might have been November time. My memory made play tricks with me. He was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. In the last 10 minutes, he'd run himself ragged, and I took him off, uh, substituted him, in the last uh, 10 minutes of the game. But for the time that he was on the pitch against Northampton, who were chasing us hard all the time, so it was a vital win for us. He was brilliant that day, was Dick Criswicky. Pace, he got that in abundance. His control of the ball, fine. His end product for delivery could have been better, but got better. But I needed then to bring John Fleming in to give some competition. What Dick did, he didn't actually sulk. We brought John Fleming in, he took the role of substitute, and I think he quite liked that because you're almost in a no-lose situation if you come on a substitute, particularly if the side's losing. But what Dick could give us in the last 20 minutes, he could give us pace and directness of running at people when they were getting tired. And he played his part very, very well.
Dennis Booth. We see Dennis as the comedian because he can be wonderful in the dressing room. Knows the game inside out. They call them holding players now. Dennis Booth was one of those players that he was never appreciated until he was not in the side. Because all he did was get the ball and give it. Probably rarely passed the ball over 10 yards. Just got it and give it available. You're in trouble? Don't worry, I'm here. Okay, you want it? Yeah, have it. What I call, and still call, a continuity player, what is now called a holding midfield player, makes other players look better and never wins the man of the match. Vital to your team, vital in the dressing room, and played something like over 700 league games, you know. Started off, I think, Blackpool, Charlton. I bought him from Southend. I love Dennis Booth. I love Dennis Booth because also, as well, lovely family background, reliable, and one of my favourites in the sense of as a person and as a player. Not favourites that I wouldn't drop him. I left him out the side, no doubt about it. I had arguments with him, told him what I thought about him. And we laugh about it now. <laughs> Peter Graham was a skillful, clever player. It took a little bit of time for him getting used because I trained players very hard. And I remember him coming to me one day and he said to me, why are we doing this? And I said to him, because what it can do, if you want to do it, Peter, it means you can run for every minute of the 90 minutes. And when a ball is going out of play, instead of you not having the fitness to run for it, you'll have the fitness to run for it. You may not get it, but the supporters will see you trying to get it. And then they will appreciate all of the qualities that you've got. So that if you are not as fit as I want you to be, you're a very talented player, lovely touch, you work it out. But if you're not fit enough and you don't chase the lost cause, the players won't, the supporters will not appreciate your qualities you've got. He took that on board and was a very important part for us, even though he got injured for the second half of the season. Arguably the most talented player that we had. Alan Harding, a talent that should have played higher. And Perhaps, you know, I haven't seen Alan since I left and perhaps he doesn't want to see me because he knows I'm right. <laughs> and I used to be in Matlock Drive in my house at the other end, he was in a clubhouse down Matlock Drive. And I used to die, drive down Matlock Drive, look into his house. His grass had grown to about a foot and a half and Alan was in his armchair, sat, <laughs> probably asleep. And I used to stop, Hardy, when are you going to come out and cut your grass? Great lad, great character talented player and all he ever wanted to do was to play for Newcastle United he would have gone and played for Middlesbrough he wanted to go back North East and I used to say to him yeah but he would go back and play in the North East I brought him from Darlington North East lad he probably lives there now and I used to say to him because he, that's who he wanted to play for and I said it's the only way you're going to leave Lincoln is if I can sell you to Newcastle Right foot, left foot. He's a, that's a, a stronger right footer than left foot. Played on the left flank. Knew the game. And he didn't have to coach Alan, you know. Alan, I, I think, you know, Lincoln City supporters will appreciate him. I don't think they fully appreciate what a talent he was. But I have to say this, like a lot of footballers, should have done better with his career than he did. Now, it doesn't make him lazy. He was a bit, probably was a bit too content to be in a nice situation and didn't always push himself, say, I want, I don't want to stay at Lincoln, I want to be a first division player. But I loved Harding, I loved, I loved coaching him, because I didn't have to coach him too much. I could just drop things in and he'd pick it up instinctively. We bought for a month, we had some injuries, we'd only got 16 players, and so if one or two get injured, I mean 14 outfield players, because two were goalkeepers of the 16, so if some get injured, you've got to bring somebody in. I brought Bert Bowery, the big black centre forward, and Tony Woodcock, who Brian Clough had been playing at left back in his reserve side. And I asked Tony Woodcock when he came, what position do you think is your best? He said up front. So we played in him a practice match, and he tore Sam Ellis and Terry Cooper apart. And I thought, that's your position. So we played in there and uh, eventually when he went back, of course, that's where he made the grade, not only for Forrest playing 
uh, with a successful Forest side, but also with England. But when I meet Tony, who is now in uh, in Germany, he always actually refers to that month he had with Lincoln. And Bert Barry was that. He was the sort of typical big centre forward. And they, I remember us beating Southport, and both of them scored goals. So we had them in for a month, and they both played a little part, but a vitally important part in helping us win the championship. Well, Peter Sellers was, he just had the one substitute appearance Peter did against Workington. We beat Workington at home 4-1 and Peter came on as a substitute. And he was just an apprentice pro. I mean, don't get me wrong, the fact that he was there and played, but he was a good lad, willing to learn, good sharp little forward play, could turn people and was sharp and quick, but was at the very early stage of his career. But he got on and he, could, he has every right to say, I played in that Lincoln side that got that record number of points. Dave Smith was a player who would, if he could hear me say this, he'd probably disappoint the first, but he, he could frustrate you because the talent this boy had. Um, he was an outside left when I first played with him. I played behind him and so, so I knew. And, he would irritate and frustrate a lot of us when we played with him. When I became the manager, I moved him in to the left side, inner left side midfield player, and he performed. Do not underestimate the ability that David Smith had. And he was a good player. Sometimes a hard boy to understand exactly where he was coming from, what he was about, but never a problem to you. And I have a great lot of time for David Smith. And it may be that... It, that in his later years he may look back at his career and think, I should have done better. But he won't be the only player that will think that. He had the talent to play at a higher level than the fourth and third division. Lincoln boy, Adelaide. Bought from Adelaide by Ron Gray. Where's he get changed? In the first team dressing room, who's he get changed next to? Sorry for, unfortunately for Wardy, it's me. Um, I wasn't saying I'm a bit of a captain, but I, I took notice of the boy. I thought, this boy's got a bit of brain about him. This boy's not an idiot. He's going to have to learn the game. And I would describe John as a manufactured player who knew how to go about scoring goals. A box player knew where to get his goals from. Only ever scored one goal outside of the penalty box, and that was against Crystal Palace. I got to know John very well, and, and as he developed, he went to Grimsby, I brought him down to Watford, he played a bit for us. Then he went on to the staff at Aston Villa, he joined me, he did a little bit of work for me when I was the England manager. And what John has done, I remember saying to him, you've got to get out of my shadow, you don't want to be known as Grant Taylor's, you've got to go and do it yourself. Went to York, did a first club job at York, Bristol Rovers, Bristol City, you name it, Wardy has done a good job. Unfortunately for him, I think it became associated with the lower divisions and like a lot of, not just John. He's a fantastic person, I have all the respect in the world. And we're close friends, it's wrong to say we're not. He lives, I'm now back in Sutton Coalfield, John lives within a mile from us. We see one another pretty regularly, we keep in contact with one another. But John Ward, a highly intelligent boy, and is a Lincoln man, born in Lincoln, played for Adelaide in the Sunday League, signed for his local club, scored 99 goals for them, and to this day regrets that, you know, in that 5-0 win against Doncaster, when in fact uh, the championship was decided, loved every minute and as sick as a pig that he never scored in it. <laughs> Which I remind him of now and again. Percy Freeman. Well, I, you know, Percy, when I took over, I sold Percy to Reading. That was a good deal. I mean, I was just coming as a new manager. And um, Percy was there, and we needed a bit of money. We'd got Dixie McNeil, and I sold Percy. And it was a good move for him. But not long after that, I brought him back, and he couldn't get back quick enough. In fact, I think if I'd offered him 50% less, because at that time, the manager did the deals. And I think if I'd offered him 50% less of what we offered him, he still couldn't back. That was Percy Freeman. 
But I told the story and I tell it about him. We were playing Doncaster that game and if we won, we were the champions. And I never, in the dressing room, I never said, had to say a word. Percy went round every player, poked them in the chest and said, hey, today's the day. We do it today. And we won 5-0, he scored two goals and he came across when it was all over. And, I'm, and before I knew, he'd hugged me, a bear hug. Now people don't believe me, they think I'm doing He actually cracked my ribs. He doesn't believe that even now. No, nobody believes that Percy Freeman, in his bear hug, cracked my ribs. And it, it is funny, it's funny for me now. But at the time, I kept, it's baby, I slept, you know, you're going to let me go. And so my reward for managing a successful side was my centre forward cracking my rib in a bear hug. But that was Percy, because, and I didn't mind that, because 90 minutes earlier he'd gone round everyone in the, in the playing staff and he'd taken over the role of saying, it's not about who's the captain, it's not about who's the manager, it's about us. And today, boys, we're going to do it. And we did it that day in front of over 14,000 people. I, Percy, Percy, I love him. What a pain in the neck. <laughs> what a pain in the neck. Yeah, my career as a manager started at Lincoln. I shall never forget that. I had some wonderful times. I served my apprenticeship to a degree at Lincoln. Hennage Dove, my chairman, was a very shrewd man. He had seen some managership leadership in me and in 72 when I'd been injured he convinced the board to give me the job. We went 11 games I think it was, drew nine and lost two and you know, Taylor out, Taylor. I totally understand that. I mean, they'd watch me as a player. Why should I become the manager? Thing happened, so he stuck by me. You never achieve anything on your own. I owe a lot to Henry's Dove and then consequently the board that he put together were very supportive of me. And uh, Henry's Dove was, was a very important man to me. He, uh, he uh, not only, uh, he gave me two great bits of advice once. He, after six weeks as a manager, he came down to see me and asked to see me in my office. Well, didn't ask, he said, look, I need to see you. And he then told me he'd been phoning my house pretty well every night and there was only Rita, my wife, in and he wanted to know where was I, what was I doing. And I said I was watching other teams and he made the point very forcibly, but, you know, you don't want to tie yourself out so much that you can't work with your team because, you know, if you get your team doing what they want, let the others worry about you. Well, he was right, of course, to a degree. Not totally, but right to a degree. And then he said to me, he gave me two pieces of advice, did Hennig, and he said to me uh, about... Um, 24 hours in a day that if you couldn't organize yourself in that 24 hours in a day then you weren't up to the job because there were only ever going to be 24 hours in a day and he didn't like people who said there's not enough hours in the day for me to do the job he didn't think they were worth employing and then he also said that if your health goes you're no good to anyone so he's making a, a, a lot of points to a very young manager and of course I took no notice of him went on and in 1999 I was struck down with a rather serious throat injury which had me rushed to hospital in an ambulance and it was there I thought to myself Hennig you were right pal you were right you've got to look after your health you've got to be right about all of these things so that's Graham Taylor very opinionated uh, very strong in his views um, likes to be structured likes to be organized likes to win but understands, although it may be hard for people to appreciate, understands that you can't win every time and that, you know, good winners know how to lose properly. I learned that, I had to learn it, and I probably had to learn it at the highest level when I became the England manager. Um, I hit my first brick wall when I was the England manager. Um, my managerial career at Lincoln, you know about that, at Watford, at Aston Villa, my first 24 games as the manager of, um, of England, my first 12 games undefeated. Best run even now as an England manager. My f European Championships, one defeat in 21 games, second defeat in 24 games against Sweden. Don't qualify, there's my brick wall. So you learn from all of these kind of things. You know, you go from it because what you don't do is ever give in. You never give in, you listen, you learn and you keep on trying to improve, trying to be better. 
And also at the same time, I think, as you do get older, and we all have that, you probably see a wider picture. And the young Graham Taylor probably didn't see that wide picture, but perhaps that perhaps was probably a good thing, because you focused in to wanting to do well. And as I say, it started off at Lincoln City for me. People think it started at Watford, but it didn't. It was at Lincoln City where it started for me. I lived in North Highcombe. I bought my first house in North Highcombe. Lincoln City had bought me for £4,500 from Grimsby Town, and I paid £3,200 for my our first um, house. So it, always, it shows you that even then, footballers were overflated, overinflated, weren't they? They paid half as much again, probably, for me than I paid for my house. On behalf of everybody who had the pleasure of watching that season, thank you very much for the memories. That's great. Great memories for all of us, and thanks for your support. Up the hymns.